Hello there, my name is Patrick Denny and welcome to this presentation about memories of Colchester at war. And you'll notice from the, the title slide here, we're going to be concentrating on childhood memories of that period. In 1939, of course, when war was declared, uh, the lives of everyone in the country really were put on hold for the next six or so years. And whilst the adults had their own trials and torments of war to contend with, the children also had their own stories to tell. And in this presentation, I'm going to be sharing with you just a, a small sample of some of those childhood memories of the period. So we're going to get underway. Um, I'll bring up my next slide and then we'll, we'll make a start. So we're going to begin here. Uh, um, Britain declares war on Germany Sunday the 3rd of September 1939. You know, this is one of those iconic dates in history where, you know, if you happen to have been there and you remember that, people remember where they were exactly when they heard that announcement. It's much the same, I think, that, you know, later on people remembered where they were when they heard that President Kennedy had got shot, for example, or even later on when Princess Diana um, was tragically killed in that accident. But certainly people remember this event it was a momentous occasion and we're going to begin by just listening to one or two examples of people who were there at the time and i'm going to begin by introducing you to olive hazel now many will remember olive um, she's sadly no longer with us but she was one of the town's tourist guides for many many years and olive was telling me that she remembered her and her family um, huddled around the radio um, on that sunday morning um, listening to Neville Chamberlain as he came on the radio and it was bad news of course he told everyone that Britain was now at war with Germany so let's have a look now at what Olive had to say about that time I can remember the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain coming on the radio about 11 o'clock on Sunday 3rd of September 1939 to announce that this country is now at war with Germany as I sat with my parents my grown-up brother and sister and one of my uncles in the kitchen of our house I had no idea at nine years old what it all meant. When bedtime that day came, I found that my parents had moved my bed into their room. During the first few weeks of the war, families had been evacuated from the east end of London into Essex. And we had a mother and a little boy billeted with us. They were very bored in the country and only stayed about two weeks, which was probably just as well for my father's blood pressure. As the first thing that the little boy had done after arriving was to pull every head from every flower in the garden, which was my father's pride and joy. We're now going to listen to the memories of John Hedges um, on the left and Jim Lawrence. Um, John also is no longer with us, but Jim, many will know, lives down in Brightlingsea. And we're going to start off by listening to John and then we'll go straight in to Jim. Although you'd been young, can you remember that happening or starting? Oh yes, I can remember that very well. I can remember that happening probably on, on Sunday morning, I believe it was. But anyway, that was about 11, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. I was stood in the, door, in the doorway, the corona man had called, with his basket of drinks, which he, which he did every week. And we were at the front door, fetching the bottles in, when there must have been a message come over the radio, and everybody stopped what they were doing. And... Uh, and that's about all I can remember of that. But that, that wasn't anything that a child would worry about no. at that particular time. It was just a, a time for excitement. Do you remember anything about um, your mother or father having to black the window there? Yes, I do. We had to, um, we had to put brown, um, brown adhesive paper across the window in a crisscross pattern to stop the windows from um, breaking or cracking. We had to black out very rigidly and strictly at night time. We had an air aid warden living right opposite us, his name was Bill Scrutton. I'm sure people will remember him. And he was very, very strict. He was only a small man, but he made himself heard. Woe well, be told you while he's coming rattle very, very hard on your, on your front door. And in no uncertain terms, tell you to cover up the crack in the window where the light was showing. What about blackouts at home? Did your parents have to obey yeah, the rules? Yeah. How, how did they do now, that? Well, we had blackout material, and that was supplied, I believe. I think that was allowed us. And, uh, and Dad would have to make a frame up, and you'd nail the blackout material over the frame, and you'd put it up, and you'd have a curtain over your door so that you could 
go through the curtain, close the curtain behind you, then open the front door and go in if right. you wanted. And, of course, the ARP man be walking around, put that light out! <laughs> yeah. yeah, knock on your door. Would yeah. You? Well, that gives them a little bit of power. They're only just ordinary <laughs> men, really, but yeah. that gives them a bit of power, you know. The, the daylight bombing raid on Old Heath um, on 3rd of October 1940 was the, the first major raid that resulted in loss of life. And um, how two houses in Scarlet's Road were destroyed and, of course, Old Heath Laundry itself. And um, we're going to listen to an experience of a lady who could remember that. This is Margaret Moss. Um, she still lives in the Old Heath area. At the time, she, she lived on Old Heath Road itself. And this is what she could remember of that time. I remember the day that Old Heath Laundry was here. I remember it as clear as if it was yesterday. Um, what, what this, this, my father used to go down and cycle along Distillery Lane and round the pond to Brackets. Uh, he used to leave at one o'clock sharp every day to get back to work. And the siren went at one o'clock. And he said, I'm off. And, and my mother said, please don't go, Jack. Please hold on. Anyway, he said, all right. And well, with, it, within four or five minutes, there was this almighty oh, bangs. Um, they'd hit the laundry. One went in Old Teeth Pond. They hit um, the house in Scarlet's Road where um, that lad and his mum were just going to go back to school. They were in, coming out the front door and they were killed. Another one fell on Old Teeth Hill and one in somebody's kitchen or something on, on Old Teeth Hill. And I can remember the our windows, how they didn't break. The, 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 you know, the vibration was terrible. My mother was on the floor with a kettle of boiling water in her hand because we all got down. She was trying to get us into the into that air raid shelter. And um, she was crawling around with this. She got this kettle of boiling water. And um, I don't know. I don't know whether I, I went back to school. I think I did. But I, 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 that did frighten me. That was the one, the nearest. Did you go down there later on to have a look? Um, we did, but not then. But later we went and mum, and there we saw that house had gone they, in, in, in Scarlet's Road. That was awful. And, um, and of course, I mean, that I've, there were three girls in that laundry, but if it had been an hour later, they'd have killed lots of girls because mm. loads of women worked in that laundry during the war. Yeah. In September 1940, um, there was an urgent communication sent out to the people of Colchester about a temporary transfer of the population, which was another name for evacuation. It, it seemed that, um, you know, at that time, that they thought invasion was likely to take place, that the moon was right, the tides were right, intelligence from across the channel suggested that if, if Hitler was going to invade, it was going to be now. The time was right for it. And um, this is part of that communication that was sent out. But if you look at the bottom two lines, it says, if invasion takes place on the Essex coast, there is a very grave risk that this town will be heavily bombed. And of course, this was a military town and that probably would have certainly been the case. And towards the middle of the month in September, over about a three day period, over 10,000 local children, uh, mothers with young babies, elderly and infirm, were hurriedly transferred out of the town on a number of special trains that took them to the various Midland towns of Stoke-on-Trent, Burton, Latimer and, and Wellingborough, um, you know, to name some of them. Um, and we have lots of memories, um, childhood memories of the children who had to do this, had to leave their families. I mean, for some children, it may have been a bit of an adventure, you know, but for others, it must have been a, a time of torment and anxiety for them. Some had probably never left their homes before. But we're going to listen to the memories of one local resident um, who was about 12 years old at the time. This is Gladys Rudd, who, who still lives in Colchester and has very clear memories of being evacuated with her younger brother and sister. Let's listen to Gladys. I was 12. I was 10. Flo was 7 when we went and of course mum and dad stayed they didn't come with us and I remember mum they they, they came down the station to see us off that was 10 o'clock in the morning when we left that was one o'clock in the next morning when we got to where we were going we hadn't got a clue where we were going we sat in the train 
and we were shunted backwards and forwards when they were shunting us onto the side and let another train through, push us through. It would stop and go all the while. And they haven't got a clue where we were because they, all the stations were names were blacked out, so we, had, we didn't even know where we were going. Nobody knew. And when we got there, we lost one boy. I went through the train, he was asleep in one of the luggage racks. <laughs> Because we're supposed to keep together, but you know what boys are? They go up down the corridors, they didn't want to stop in. And when we got up there, we, they heard that the all in, um, that was dark, and they, we finished up in this, must have been a church hall. They had us all stripped and washed, lit nurse there, make sure nobody got anything wrong with them, and um, then we had something to eat and drink. And then we were like cattle. You had to stand and wait to be picked out while all these men and women went around. Well, that finished up. There was Georgie Dempster and Albert and my sister and I there. We were left. And um, anyhow, they come around. That finished up. My brother went off with someone. And then this couple came. Well, we were... Where we went, we weren't supposed to be there because that was just outside the boundary. We were Longton, and we were just in Longton, but we were just over the boundary. And of course, they let us have a couple of us because there was no one else to go. Well, for two days, we couldn't find my brother. And of course, I was ever so upset because I was responsible for my brother and sister. I'd lost my brother. And on the Sunday night, there was a knock on the door, and Uncle Tom, Mosley their name was, Uncle Tom went to the door. So I said, yes, you'd better come in. We've got two girls here. Mm. She came in, she said, thank God, she said, we've had a terrible time with your brother. Because he, he, I mean, he, he, he couldn't understand why we weren't together. Mm. And, they, and no one knew, they couldn't understand where we were. They couldn't find us because we were out of the air. We were just... At the crossroad was there, we were here. And he, 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 she said, thank God we found you. She said, do you only know what we've been going through trying to find you? And I always remember my first Friday night there. The sirens went and they shoved my sister and I under the table. And you never heard such a racket. Guns were going, bombs were going. We hadn't had nothing of that in Colchester. We didn't know what, didn't know what a gun was. And they were all... Guns were going, the bombs were coming down, and we sat in there, and my, uh, my sister was having the stirrups, and I, I, there was me, I'm like this, but I thought, good snake flow, be quiet, be quiet, you know. And of course that went off, but I said, I didn't think I'd ever live through something like that. This is Gordon Williams. Now, Gordon um, lived in London as a child, but he was evacuated down to Colchester. Um, he now lives in Tree in Hertfordshire. Um, and he's got fond memories of his time here in the town, and uh, let's see what he had to say. Not long after the outbreak of war, when I was eight years old, I was sent from London to live with my grandmother in Winchester Road. I was enrolled at Canterbury Road School and soon was integrated into a happy school life. I recall that my classmates were kind and friendly, although I was teased about my accent, which could have had a hint of Cockney. But this way of life was not to last, because in September 1940, we were evacuated en masse to Hyam Ferrers in North Hants. When we arrived, we were lined up to be picked out like cattle in a market to join our prospective guardians. I had no contact with my family for a year. My father was in the Navy and my mother in war work, and letters were very scarce. It can be summed up as the most miserable period of my life. No counselling or help. You just had to make the best of it. Well, Gordon did eventually return to Colchester, and um, this is what he had to say. We eventually returned to Colchester, and on one occasion, following a school visit to the castle, we were walking down Long Wire Street when the distinctive noise of a German bomber was heard overhead. It began to machine gun the street, and some of us were hastily taken into a butcher shop and pushed into a large refrigerator at the back of the shop. I'm not sure how long we were in there, other than feeling mighty cold and brushing against the hanging carcasses. Now, there's an interesting postscript um, to Gordon's story, 
because after a while he he was able to go back home to London but it was a little bit of um, you know out of the frying pan into the fire let's see what he had to say towards the end of 1943 there seemed to be a lull in the bombing of London and I returned home little did I know that six months later I would be a victim of one of the first flying bombs to fall on London the bombing took place early one Sunday morning in June 1944 the bomb landed about a hundred yards away and our house was severely damaged by the blast. Unfortunately, I was asleep within the mansard roof of the house and I ended up being buried under the timbers, slates and brick chimney, most of which thankfully missed me. After being dug out, I was taken to St. Bartholomew's Hospital where I spent three days suffering from concussion and having my wounds stitched up. And the final evacuation story um, is from Joy Cardi. Um, she was Joy Fisher when she was a child, and um, she now lives up in, in the north of England. But um, she's got an interesting tale to tell. Um, her name was Fisher, as you can see, and her father was called Archie Fisher. And Archie Fisher's brother was someone called Handy Fisher. And many will, will know that Handy Fisher at the time was mayor of Colchester. So let's see what Joy had to say. I remember the time when my mother, my younger brother and sister and I were evacuated to Stoke-on-Trent and it was dark when we got there. We were all taken to a church and were given these rough camp beds to lie on. I think my mother and our next door neighbour laid down on their coats. The next day they came to billet everyone. It was difficult for us because my mother had got three small children and nobody really wanted that. We were finally sent to a miner's house, which was like one of those houses you see in Coronation Street with a passage running down the back. I can remember him coming home from work, very black, with just his eyes showing, and we were given money to run along to the corner shop to buy some sweets. It was impossible for us to remain there, and I remember my mother being very agitated and going along to the town hall to complain. She made a bit of a fuss and mentioned that her brother-in-law was the mayor of Colchester. So we were moved to a semi-detached house in a rather nice area. The next thing we're going to discuss is the, the air raid on the Chapel Street area on the 28th of September 1942. This was another daytime raid, uh, about 11 o'clock or so in the morning. And um, on this particular occasion, there, there was no air raid warning. So the plane just dropped out the sky, the bombs dropped and um, caused devastating damage. So we're going to listen to one or two memories about this and we're going to begin by listening to Joan Watson who at the time was a pupil at nearby St John's Green School and um, she lived in the area as well. So let's hear what Joan had to say. But the huge memory of that is there was a, uh, we were told that we'd go under our desks if something happened unannounced so to speak and we went um, there was a huge, huge explosion and we did all dive under our desks. Now they were desks with the great metal legs and the lift up lids and the inkwell on there and we, were, we would be under there and we found out what had happened. Um, a German plane was being chased by a Spitfire, this was all found out afterwards, and to um, lighten his load so he could pick up speed, he just dropped the bombs willy-nilly, although he wasn't far off the barracks that were there. And it went straight down um, from South Street, uh, Wellington Street, um, and into Essex Street, and all those houses were absolutely dropped away, um, and it was extraordinary. If a few feet one way or the other, he'd have either hit my home or he'd have hit the school mm -hmm. and my mother was at home with my baby brother she picked him up and, th and she could hear screaming and other mothers were there at the school thinking the school had been hit but that was a very very lucky escape Good. very very lucky escape this is jim watson this is joan's husband and Jim could also remember that event. But what we're going to listen to now is, is two little um, occasions. The first one, when he was a young lad, he was playing in some fields in the Lexington area, and they saw this plane attack a train near Chits Hills. And then 
he's going to mention when he was in the playground at St Helena School when he, they saw the plane come over on its way to drop the bombs on the Chapel Street area. So here's Jim. Uh, yes, my, there's quite a few of us. There was a field behind where we lived and we used to go over there. It was winter and it was snowing, not heavily, but snowing at the time. And we heard a plane coming and then we saw it going, not far, and it was very low. It was a Messerschmitt. Uh, which, as children, we all recognised all the planes, the German and English planes. And we watched this, and it was going from our left to right, uh, towards the railway line, that Chits Hills, actually, uh, is where it went. Because then, what, shortly after, we heard this gunfire. And I thought, oh, my God, who's he shooting up? Mm. And uh, we heard later it was a train which was shot at, and uh, a man in there, who apparently was a pianist, um, lost some fingers off one hand. I was at St Helena School. We were out in the playground one morning. Don't ask me the dates. You've no. probably got them anyway. But uh, we saw this German plane come over from uh, the London direction and we could, it, it was new enough for us to recognise as a, a, a German bomber. It might have been a Dornier, perhaps, I can't remember. And uh, we watched it and we saw bombs coming out of it. So we all dashed like hell to the shelters. And apparently it was the bombs, which my wife has been speaking about, probably, uh, along the uh, south south street yeah, chapel street, street. Chapel yeah, street and, uh, that so as i say we went like hell when yeah, we saw goodness. this obviously the the final memory of the of the chapel street bombing is, is going to be told to us by dennis marchant um, who you can see here on the right dennis was born in 1942 just two weeks after this raid so dennis's mother was pregnant with him at the time and um, the house that she was in was um, was flattened by the bombs and she was buried underneath all the rubble. And um, Dennis is going to explain to you the, the story in a moment. But on the left, you, you may have seen this um, this monument or this stone monument with a plaque on, which has been erected on the side of Southway near where Chapel Street was. And um, it's got on here Chapel Street Air Raid, 28th September. And it mentions that eight people were killed, 30 houses destroyed, and 275 houses damaged. So that's in remembrance of those people um, who lost their lives and their houses. And you'll notice there's a little bit of writing underneath that. And that says that this monument was unveiled on the 75th anniversary, on the 28th of September 2017, by Dennis Marchant, who was born two weeks after his mother was dug from ruins of a bombed house. So let's listen to Dennis's story. But because of the blast in Essex Street, um, the houses in facing Essex Street, opposite the Carpenter's Arms, all took the blast. And where we lived at 21 was not had at all for um, three years, possibly. And so as and when they rescued me mother, they took her up to Ipswich Road to live with her in-laws. Of course, my father was away in the war. What my mother told me was that when when the house collapsed, the beams came down from the bedroom above and they landed on the mantel shelf, forming a like a half a tent, I suppose you could say, and all the ceiling and the bed, whatever, came down on there. And of course, I suppose the roof came in as well. And at that time, they were, I suppose, in the early hours of it, they were looking after the pe people in the street, knowing that they'd got to dig out. She could hear voices, but and she was shouting, "I'm here! I'm here!" If they heard her or not, I couldn't. I couldn't say. But eventually, they did dig in, into the into the property, and they were able to work out that they could get her out, and they must have removed the rubble at the front and got her out. You were being carried when all this was. Yes, when this going was happening. And of course, then if you see my birth certificate and my Christian certificate, I was christened at St John's in Ipswich Road. And the address on my birth certificate is 281 Ipswich Road. 
one of the the biggest bombing raids that um, certainly resulted in the the most destruction of property was the raid on St Butler's Corner in February 1944. This was a nighttime raid just after midnight and um, it caused devastating damage. Um, huge fires that could be seen for miles. Two large clothing factories, Hollingtons and Leanings, were totally flattened. Um, lots of houses, shops, public house, um, a, a really um, you know, devastating time. And we're going to listen, we're going to go back to Margaret Moss, John Hedges and Gladys Rudd, who've all got memories, um, childhood memories of this event. We're going to start with Margaret and then we'll move on to John and then to Gladys. The one night that I do remember was when St Bottles, when they hit St Bottles Station and all around that area. Mum, can remember Mum, I think we, I don't know whether we were up or she got us up, but she said, oh, come out here. And we stood on the garden seat and that looked as if the whole of Colchester was on fire. I've never seen, the sky was red with, with the flames. And, and, I, and I, 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 again, that was a, the next day, I think we must have gone down to see it because it was awful. Well, probably not the next day, but we went down and uh, most of those Hollingtons had gone, hadn't it? And all those shops all around the, ch the China shop and all, all those, well, they were all burnt out. They, it, it, that was awful. I did go remember going to see that, walking around there and seeing it as a child and thinking how terrible. But we just had to get on with it. Mm. But so you sort of, I suppose, as a child, you just took it in your stride, didn't you? And I usually found my way to the bedroom window to see what was going on rather than going down the shelter. And uh, on one night I saw um, the whole coast appeared to be ablaze. And that was the very night that St Bottles Corner got hit. Mm. Well, I could see the, see the glow from the town because, I mean... If you can remember during the war, there were no lights on anywhere, so anything that was going, you could see quite clearly, and you could see some bottles, some bottles quite clearly glowing in the, in the night. We knew that something had happened. Did you get to see it at all? The next morning I did, yes. I should have been, to, been at school, but like many other children, we didn't go to school that morning. We went down to some bottle station, and that was absolute chaos down there. Hose pipes everywhere. Water running everywhere, black ash everywhere. And um, we had a little sandbag each, where I think uh, that was around Griffin's or Griffin's Furniture Depository just inside Osborne Street. That had been completely flattened, but there were lots of bits and pieces laying about on the ground, which we put into the blackened and put into the um, sandbags and took home. Spent the rest of the day cleaning it up with Vim in the sink, <laughs> trying to get all the black off of it. Um, you wouldn't get away with it today, would you? What about the St Buttle Street? I worked at Hollington's and I worked in the coupon office. Of course, we knew there'd been a raid and we knew what that went round and what happened. But anyway, we went into to town to see what we'd got to do because we hadn't got no jobs. And they told us we could go home and they'd notify us what they were going to do. Well, they'd already been bombed. In London, they had their place there then, and that got bombed, and they got moved down to Colchester, some to Luton. That was before Colchester got bombed. Well, then Colchester got bombed, so, of course, everybody was all distributed everywhere mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Well, I finished up going up to London every day, coming back, and what happened was, um, because we had the clothing coupons, they couldn't risk putting them on the train to be taken off the other end because they would lose, they would get lost. So one of the men used to go home to London every night to take them on. When that got bombed, he got sent elsewhere. Well, I took over, because my office had gone, I, d I went up and down to London every day. Finally, um... The war in Europe came to an end in May 1945. Obviously, there was lots of rejoicing going on all over the place. And in Colchester, lots of street parties um, and other events going on. And um, this particular one we're looking at is um, a street party that took place um, in Cavendish Avenue and Canwick Grove. And um, 
there was a big fancy dress party and then everybody went over to the wick and we're going to just hear about this from Maureen Ruddock um, who still lives in Darcy Road in Colchester and um, she's also pictured there aged 11 um, which was just shortly after this event took place so here's Maureen we were all invited to the VA, VA Day celebrations and as children there was a whole group of us dressed up in various fancy dress and we congregated in Canwick Grove where we were all judged and the rest of it and we all looked very nice. Just people from the whole area? Could it was Old Heath, it was just, no not all Old Heath, it was just part of, road, no, no, I think it was just mainly Old um, Cavendish Avenue, Barn Hall, I don't even know it was Barn Hall, the very gardens, Canwick Grove. Darcy Road, probably, okay. just mm -hmm. sort of a uh, local yeah. community. And um, then after the fancy dress parade, we then there was loads of trestle tables up the centre of Cavendish Avenue, where we all sat, I don't know how many, there was hundreds of us, I'm sure, mm -hmm. um, had our cakes and jellies and all the rest of it. Where did they get it. all the food from? Well, each individual, I think, um, sort of gave something, you know, okay. so that, that would... Uh, Otherwise, I mean, it would never been done, would it? No. No. I think each uh, parent um, gave something to the party. And would that have been it, or did they have games and things afterwards? Well, after, after that was all over, there was a, a programme for this, obviously. We um, did a victory march from Cavendish Avenue down Old Heath Road as far as Darcy Road. Then we came up Darcy Road, which at the time was still a field and unmade. When we got to the top, we squeezed through a gap in the hedge and ditch. Right. Um, went over onto the wick, the army land, and um, had fun and games. We had sort of races, you know, of various sorts, and um, pony rides. Uh, fun was had by all. Being right. children, of course, we then went home and went to bed. Well, that's where we're going to leave it. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to these childhood memories of Colchester at war.